All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Hedwig Heershop, and I am the CPA program coordinator. And thank you all so much for coming today. It looks like we have a fun crowd to share this afternoon with. Before we get started, I have a few announcements, of course. You know, we want to plug our program. So you found this uh, brochure on your seat for the Pi Photography, Ideas and Experience that we're launching this fall. October 30th to November 2nd, right here in this uh, room. And we're looking forward to it. And um, we also want to urge you to look at these beautiful flyers for the fine print program. You want the sound up a little? Sound guy, can somebody s put the sound up? Can we just turn on the first slide? This is very high. Just push. Yeah, it's up. No, okay, it's okay. There you go, just leave it there. Perfect. Okay. I thought my voice was loud enough, but okay. So we get uh, going again. So membership, uh, fine print program started, and uh, after the lecture, I'd be happy to talk to you about the Pi and about the fine print program membership. So after the lecture, come find me in the gallery, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, also, uh, we have a beautiful catalog created by Takihawa Design for sale for $20 in the gallery. And all the artist work are, is in there and beautiful. Um, also, we have a raffle. Uh, we have three prints, Bindan, Betty, oh no, not Betty, Jane and Shelby. And uh, Jane is donating uh, beautiful tin types and Bindan. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsors, Tracy Morrison and Robin Ward, and myself, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's my favorite uh, niche, you guys. And I also want to uh, thank all the volunteers and docents in advance for this exhibit, because the docents, you know, tell our story to the public and all the volunteers who put everything together, you know, in the gallery, for the reception, in here, they all work very hard. And um, I would like to thank all of them. Yes. And in particular, I would like to thank, um, let's see, David Clarkson, is he here? There? And Nick Papadakis, because they gave me uh, great help and support uh, mounting this exhibit, and I want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Then I would like to introduce the curator to the show, Shelby Graham, right here. And um, yeah, Shelby. <laughs> Shelby has been the director, curator of the Mary Potter Sessnan Art Gallery at the University of California, Santa Cruz, UCSC, as we all know it, since 1999. A selection of her curatorial works include Three Lives in Photography, Robert Dawson, Joel Levick, David Pace, 2014, Three Lives in Photography, oh yeah, I just said that, and The Dinner Parties, Art and Agriculture, The Harrison Studio on Mixing, Mapping, and Territory, 2013, Katharina Lanfranco, Natural Selections, 2012, Louis Watts, New Orleans Suite, 2012, Busy Lady, Interruptions of Hierarchies, 2008, Image as Object, 2006, Hank Williams Thomas, Signifying Blackness, 2006, and The Rhetoric of the Post, Rethinking Hannah Wilk, 2005, Bin Dan, Immortality, The Remnants of the Vietnam and American War, 2002. Graham is on the planning committee for a new Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UCSC. She has taught courses in photography, digital arts, and new media contemporary art and museum practices at the University of California, Santa Cruz, San Jose University, Cabrillo College, Aptos, Hartnell College, Salinas, and Sinan Kakin University in Kyushu, Japan. Did I say that right? Yes. Oh, wow. She's also co-curating an exhibit on Okinawa with UCSC history students. I don't know where you get all your time, but you're busy. Um, due to the complexity of alternative lineage, Graham is actively seeking grants to expand her research into a larger comprehensive museum exhibition, including many alternative processes artists. So I wish you, you know, well with that. So I will give the floor to Shelby. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. I, I will speak up because it was a little hard to hear. Um, so thank you and welcome to CPA, Center for Photographic Arts. Uh, I wanted to thank um, the center for inviting me to, be, to curate this exhibition. And I think it had a little bit to do with Brian Taylor, who's on the board of directors. Um, but I wanted to thank Jerry Takagawa and um, Tracy Morrison and Robin Ward for supporting this um, exhibition. And it's been a fabulous experience. Um, I'm I am busy. I have a full-time job with a one-month furlough, so I did this over my furlough. And um, anyway, it's really fun. And the catalog is fabulous, so please um, look at it. It has a lot of details, and the printing is outstanding. The design is exquisite. So thank you. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this project, and um, I am stalling because Bin Don is on his way. But um, so this project uh, originated um, when when the center invited me to do a show. I th um, they said, "Go ahead, do something." Thing, you know, you can, you can do it on anything, but if you, you know if you want to do it on alternative processes, that's well received here. And so I thought about who were um, some of my favorite alternative process photographers, and I thought immediately of Betty Hahn. So this, um, even though Betty Hahn is still in the middle of the lineage, um, she was the um, the starting point for for my curating this exhibition. Um, and so I said, well, if I can get Betty Hahn, then I'll do it. So before I said yes, I'll do this. I I, um, I said, Brian, get me Betty Han's uh, email, and I invited Betty Han, and she said yes. I think she was in Cuba at the time, and then um, so the idea was to do a lineage of um, from mentor to student to mentor to student all the way down the line. And um, Betty said, well, why don't we include Henry Holmes Smith, who was my um, who was my teacher. So we started Henry Holmes Smith, Betty Hahn, and then Betty uh, Brian Taylor. And then I fit myself right in there. Um, I studied with Brian Taylor. And then um, one of my first students was Bin Don as a high school student uh, here at, well, at San Jose at Gunderson High School. And he was the only one paying attention during the history of photography <laughs> lesson. And um, and then there are some stories. Maybe I'll tell him now since Bin isn't here. Uh, but um, he just was so smart and started out doing um, we did pinhole cameras, and he made a whole set of negative images from his family photos that were in his wallet, and and um, after we sh I showed him how to do that, and he the students came out and said, how do you know how to make a negative print? And he said, well, she just showed us how to make uh, a positive from a negative. I thought I could just make a negative, uh, uh, a negative from a positive, and uh, he just understood that connection that. Posi that negative positive relationship that we all film photographers kind of learned at day one and the digital photographers are still trying to learn in Photoshop. <clears throat> But um, anyway, so Bin Don was, you know, superstar as a high school student, went on to San Jose State and then to Stanford and studied with Joel Levick there with his MFA. And then uh, he went on to, now he's teaching at Arizona State University where he invited Jane Lindsay, his fabulous student. Um, and so... Um, Anyway, that's just the crux of it. I will have, um, when Ben comes, I might have all these guys stand up. Um, so let me say that, um, back to Betty Hahn. So Betty Hahn uh, received her MFA in 1966. So um, she was studying with Henry Holmes Smith at e Indiana University, so in the Midwest. She did her undergrad and graduate school there. Um, and then... Um, the, the thing that's great about Betty is that she was one of the first women photographers to really do mixed media um, in photography. And Henry Holmes Smith said, hey, why don't you try this alternative process? So I really feel that uh, th that the mentors kind of um, helped urge this creative experimental practice. Um, after she did her MFA, she went on to RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, and she has some fabulous stories that possibly, I don't know, if, is that where you were the only woman on staff? Br briefly, right. Uh, and so she taught there, and some of her students who might be showing up today, she met at RIT, and one of the students that helped with the slideshow was one of her students. So she keeps in touch with her students, and it's really a nice thing to see, and, and Brian Taylor has always told us about her. In fact, I grew up with The Lone Ranger, watching The Lone Ranger, and so when I first saw The Lone Ranger series, when Brian showed me Betty Hahn's Lone Ranger series, I realized, wow, this is the this is where you can combine popular culture, uh, a little bit of um, 
male dominance, racism, all these things that kind of are underlying in our early television years that we didn't even know was happening. <laughs> um, and then she mixed media. She uh, ended up drawing on her photographs. She was breaking these rules. And then later she started sewing on her photographs. So she really did do some fabulous thing that uh, when Brian showed her work, it really unleashed um, some creative energy in my work. So I really, I really appreciate that. Um, and let's see, one more thing. So after the RIT, um, she went to University of New Mexico, that's in Albuquerque, and there is where she had this whole host of fabulous students, and one of them was Brian Taylor. Uh, another famous student in the in the lot was uh, Joel Peter Whitkin. A lot of you maybe heard about him. Um, and at while she was at New Mexico, she was studying. You know, she was teaching with Van Deren Koch, uh, Beaumont Newhall, the big art, uh, you know photo historian, and then um, Thomas Barrow. You know, many all these people that we know of. And so um, the thing that's great about pulling this back into the Center for Photographic Art is that we. I'll pay homage to you know um, Ansel Adams and Edward Weston and and these workshops and I took friends of photography workshops here in the 80s um, and we learned I learned Xerox <laughs> how to how to manipulate Xerox which is which is fun um, well good so let me just um, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Taylor so he can. Um, just say a few famous words about Betty, but no, I think maybe some you, you can add a little fun to that. But um, yeah, please welcome um, Brian Taylor. Thank you, Shelby. I, I'll just keep this very brief. I could I could brag about Betty Hahn uh, all day, that's for sure. But I, I just want to pick up on something that Shelby mentioned. Speaking of lineage. Um, you know, if you if you go back to the early days of manipulation in photography, uh, you know, um, in the 19th century there was hand coloring and there was manipulation uh, almost from the start, and it took its its I think most beautiful form in pictorialism with Dimashi and other people, gum printers in in the 1890s. But, but I must say, you know, we're standing on ground zero here, you know, Western country. I think it was uh, F64 that kind of put, put a lid on uh, manipulation. And I'm, this is a very speedy, you know, uh, overview. <laughs> I'm going out on a limb, so feel free to saw it off on me. Um, but F64, you know, and Ansel Adams and their magnificent work, you know, done just down the road, took, took the the population and, and led them to straight photography away from uh, from manipulation. And what I what I want to bring Betty Hahn into this about is that she was definitely one of the pioneers and one of the the few women pioneers who who uh, who gave uh, manipulation a rebirth in the 1960s and 70s, along with one of her classmates, Jerry Yulesman. You, you know, they've been pals. They were in grad school together, I think. He went his way, you went your way. But uh, those were the pioneers that, that created this resurgence in putting our hands back into photography. And then uh, Van Deren Koch started this incredible program at the University of New Mexico. He had just been the director of the George Eastman House. He went to UNM and they gave him funding. They said, make this you know, a dynasty in photography. And so he handpicked, he goes, who should I get to talk about the history of photography? Mm, how about Beaumont Newhall? So Van Deren Koch brought in Beaumont Newhall and he said, who should I bring in in all the country you know, to talk about uh, putting an artist's hands in their work, and he picked Betty Hahn. Um, so it was was an absolute privilege to be a student there. And in Betty's class, it was this great uh, laboratory of experimentation, and it, and I loved every minute of it. And I loved her then, and I love her now. So let's talk about Betty Hahn. Yeah. That's what we're here. For. Okay. <laughs> Can we have the lights down? I'll start. Hopefully this is going to start. Um, yeah. Well, I am really honored to be here. Uh, thrilled, actually. This is really, really special. Everything uh, surrounding this show has been so beautifully organized, so so good-tempered, so patient, just, just great. The catalog... Uh, is is perfectly written. I urge you to read it because there's not a wasted word in it. Lots of information, just the right amount. So anyway, I'm going to start some of these. By the way, I started with a Leica. 
Okay, when I was in graduate school, I started doing uh, non-silver processes, gum bichromate, um, at the urging of Henry Smith, my teacher. And I guess it was experimental. Um, Henry uh, came from Illinois Institute of Technology. It was actually the new Bauhaus. The old Bauhaus uh, came from Germany. It was in Weimar in 1919, and Henry was lucky enough to study with Maholi Naj. Maholi Naj was lucky enough to get out of Germany. Thank God. He went to Chicago, and and the whole point of the Bauhaus, the old Bauhaus and the new Bauhaus, was to experiment. Not a dirty word. Um, I was a kid. I didn't know what was a good thing to do in photography. I met Henry Smith. I was 17 when I got there. Uh, he was my undergraduate counselor, and he stayed my counselor all the way through to MFA graduation. And. I, I, one thing I'd like to uh, talk about is where ideas come from in non-silver. I mean, you have all these processes, hundreds of them floating around now. And I remember when I started and, you know, why I started uh, what I did. First of all, the paper. This is drawing paper. This is uh, Fabriano printmaking paper. You can soak this paper, but it stays paper. If you make etchings on this or lithographs, I, w I felt more at home with this paper than photo paper, than, remember, RC coated paper and whatnot? As much as I love that photo image coming up in the developer, uh, when I saw this type of image coming up, it was in color. So anyway, here uh, on drawing paper, a couple things is uh, back to paper. My uh, grandfather worked in a paper factory in Chicago. He was a cutter. And he would send me to kindergarten with strips of cut cuttings, long strips of paper. I would take them to the nuns they would love this because we could sit around and weave things out of these strips. And he just was always giving them paper. Everybody loved the free paper. Uh, the other thing about uh, where ideas come from, where you might feel comfortable, where I felt comfortable, I was sitting in an art history class, um, graduate school in Indiana, and uh, it was uh, the history of illuminated manuscripts from the Middle Ages. I saw these beautiful pictures, and they were organized like this, a vertical on one side, two horizontals on the right side, and I just went, ah, oh, wow. And I saw these spatial organizations and I was holding dozens of codolith negatives and positives around, and I thought, this is a way to base these photographs without wasting any film or any paper. I could put them on these big sheets. So this is, uh, this is a, a 11 by 14 inch codoliths side by side, and this is 1968. So I started 65, and uh, this one picture of my sister out in a highway in uh, near Washington D.C. And I would I would try to find colors that were already in the scene, so everybody knows when a highway is new, black and yellow. Uh, more pictures of uh, my sisters. This is this is a little washed out. It was difficult for me to get the color right in the beginning. I ended up switching from watercolor pigment to gouache, which is a more intensified color. And I didn't do multiple gum prints. I could never make a really full-scale color print, but I could do side-by-sides. And my first moves were to take those 
Leica photographs, and in this case, Rolleiflex photographs, negatives, and use those. And I was working with images that were moving, and there was a, a slight blur in them. So I just simply switched from what I was doing in black and white to the gum prints in color. Uh, then later, this is 1970 now, I started working on fabric for a while, and it was somewhat accidental, somewhat experimental. Now, I must say, I love the Bauhaus because their whole goal was experiment. They, that, they wanted experimental uh, typography, architecture, furniture, any kind of design. Uh, I didn't know that to be experimental might be a bad thing until I landed at RIT teaching there. Well, those people knew what a photograph should look like, and it wasn't this. So, um, but, you know, by then it was too late. <laughs> Uh, this is an 11 by 14 inch negative uh, on the fabric. I treated the fabric like paper. I mean, a lot of paper is rag anyway. So I starched these fabrics with liquid starch, um, very crisp. Then I uh, sprayed them down with fine, fine mist of water, then ironed them until I had a real surface to work on. It was a, uh, it wasn't paper, but it was as close as I could get to it, simply to make the gum print stick on the fabric and look better. I wanted as many tones as I could get. So here is, and I uh, did simple stitching. I had never stitched in anything before, but once the picture was on the fabric, well, I couldn't draw on it, I couldn't paint on it, so what's left, huh? Thread, color, thread. And here, um, I did a series of vegetables. Some, somebody once asked me if I thought I was trying to ridicule or mock Edward Weston by doing this lettuce. Well, you know, furthest thing from my mind, um, I, I did understand somewhat uh, about uh, values and details. I had lost detail in the shadow. I had lost detail in the highlights. Uh, so I simply restored them, darker thread and lighter thread, you know, moving toward a zone system fabric <laughs> photograph. <laughs> Um, and really just simple in-out stitches. Another reason for uh, doing these things, you know, writers, writers write, they write letters, they write journals, they write diaries. I have never written anything except postcards and a few recommendations for graduate schools. I'm just not a writer. Uh, I do take pictures, and I realize this whole set of pictures from beginning to end is really, it's my life in pictures. It's my journal, year after year, event after event. Uh, this is a trip to Switzerland, and I did get more sophisticated with thread. These are French knots. Uh, another... Uh, vegetable here, a broccoli, same thing. Loss of detail in the shadows, loss of detail in the highlights. The same vegetables I did later. These are uh, two inch squares. These are Rolleiflex contact prints. Not very high contrast and they were uh, of course, a torso hand-holding hand fruits or vegetables, the color coming from the dominant color of the fruit or the vegetable. And there's a set of 12 of these 
and you will you saw the uh, cauliflower. That's just the same broccoli. So photographing single vegetables, getting my neighbor to come over, hold these in front of the camera, and then cook them. Nothing wasted. <laughs> this one's in the show. This is a, a soft daguerreotype. It's very soft, just kind of spongy. It's actually Xerox. This is the original Xerox invented in Rochester in the when 60s, I guess. Somebody figured out how to copy using uh, static electricity and little toner beans. Well, in the beginning, it was an office equipped with a copy camera, a plate. The plate got uh, uh, electrosensitized. The little toner beads were placed on it. That plate then got put into a uh, it was kind of a vat, kind of sideways, and it had to be fumed so that the toner beads melted. Well, this is really dangerous. It was about on par like daguerreotypes. Very tricky. Uh, my friend Joel had one of these machines in Rochester. One of the technicians at Xerox just simply gave it to him because you know, this stuff was going obsolete every year, an improvement was made. And the fabric is a kind of a um, plastic coated jersey. If I left it in that vat of fumes too long, the whole thing started to melt. So I had to leave it in there just, just long enough for the toner beads to adhere to the fabric. Tricky. Okay. This, this is part of the series that is upstairs in the gallery. This one is Starry Night. Those are, imagine, silver stars in the sky. It's a cyanotype of the Lone Ranger in Tonto. I have been enchanted by Western images since uh, I was a little kid. I watched the Lone Ranger on on TV when I was little. The series started off actually called Tonto Erased because Tonto was always in the background. He was the one he'd go into town, get beat up, come back, save the day. The Lone Ranger would take credit for it. People, <laughs> who was that masked man? I want to thank him. Uh, you know, so, but it seemed a little. Uh, adding insult to injury to call the series Tonto Erased. So uh, I renamed it. And at, at different times, the Lone Ranger is emphasized. Sometimes the horse is emphasized. Sometimes Tonto's emphasized. Here's one where the horse, Silver, one of my favorite TV characters. OK. Um, Another series, these flowers on paper. Now these are 16 by 20, so the codolith negative, same size, contact print. I was incredibly moved by the beautiful Japanese paintings of the Edo period. Uh, they used uh, uh, metallic for the backgrounds, so I have, this is metallic gouache on the flower. Um, sometimes I put it in the background, sometimes in the foreground. I chose flowers, mostly iris, sometimes peonies, but I chose flowers that were essentially blue and brown to start with. One of the things is that not all of your ideas, not all of my ideas go into non-silver processes. You just can't force them. If it doesn't fit, get a bigger hammer, doesn't work. So here's one with uh, the background. Metallic gold has no space. It just, it just simply reflects a lot of light. And then uh, also painted on the chrysanthemum with uh, drawing, P 
painting. At this, at this point, I realized that by repeating negatives, printing the same one over and over, like the Lone Ranger, like the, like the uh, flowers, I was doing something my teacher did. Uh, he used dye transfer almost exclusively, and he reprinted the same negatives each time something different. I learned a little bit each time. I've, I've done lots of other projects, lots of other mediums, but this was, this was a big learning occupation, I think, for me. I, I learned how to do things, and I was always curious how things looked photographed, how things looked painted how the combination looked, photographed and painted. So now this one is a little too light. This, you'll have to kind of imagine this as a dark brown background. And this one, okay, same flower in blue. And then looking a little washed out and trying trying to get the co the colors deep enough uh, was a matter of choosing the right papers some of the printmaking papers don't hold the non-silver processes so well others seem to hold it perfectly this is from a series on cowboys this one is called white horse white hat white guy and it, it's about those films from the late 30s early 40s where the hero is always a white guy he's always wearing a white hat he's always wearing or is always riding a white horse you know who's who because uh the guy with the mustache guy with the black hat is the evil one so I have a whole set of these pictures. This one's in the show. Um, here's another one from the same, the same uh, series. Uh, the series is called B Westerns. Uh, and this is a lithograph with a blend in the sky, a sheen collet, which is a uh, severely glued paper to paper, archival paper, glued to archival paper, rolled up through the litho press, and then it has a uh, crayon, crepa, chalk, whatnot over that. I like these little stories that I could make up about these people in the movies, the B-Westerns, uh, cowgirls and cowboys. Um, this one is, just let me explain it to you one more time. Well, that's the foreman talking. Now, the girl's the one who owns the ranch. But, you know, he's going to kind of tell her what's going on. She knows already. But in those movies, uh, the girls were dumb. They had to be, or... Well, you know, not much use for them. Uh, I was, you know, really keeping track of who the who the hero guy was. You know, this one, you know, he's good. White horse, white hat, and uh, I have I have some other ones. Um, mounted police. Uh, the other thing is, there's a kind of a symbol with those hearts up there in the sky that gets scribbled. I, I have a. Um, Another series, which is about uh, broken broken hearts and romance, failed romance number two twenty one and whatnot, that happened in movies too. Okay, so so now if you have questions about this, um, come see me after this or right now. I can answer some. If you have some, any, any questions? 
Betty, did you ever cross paths with Minor White back in your RIT? Did I what? Uh, did you cross paths with Minor White? You know what happened? I got Minor White's class. When I started teaching at RIT, I got his class, which was fourth year fine arts photography. And I the thought they weren't quite expecting that. Right? I thought they really trusted me. I thought, oh, these guys, they think uh, nobody else wanted to teach that class. These kids were, they'd been in classes with each other for four straight years. And boy, when, when we had a crit, and the first day I went in, I said, well, what do you think about that? You know, and one of them said, yeah, it sucks. And I went, oh, my God. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to start from scratch. I had to figure out how to teach. So, and, of course, I wanted to teach like Henry Smith did. But I'm not Henry Smith, so I had to work it out. You, you were, you know, your aesthetic is so different than minor whites that the students have to make a real a shift in that. Yeah, I really, I liked his work very much. I, it was one of the, the Aperture magazines, one of the few things we read in graduate school, so I knew exactly who he was. I certainly, by the time I got to teaching at RIT, I knew how the zone system worked. I just didn't use it very much. <laughs> about the balance in your life between teaching and creating and how that worked for you? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, I, um, somebody asked me about that once a long time ago, how did I said, oh, there's just nothing to it, you know, you just have to prioritize, not a thing, it's just so easy, you just do this and then you do that. Well, ha ha, <laughs> and when you get overloaded and when things start to all fall on the same week and the same day, it really does get, you know, go haywire, so it, it's tough. But I will say this, that the um, teaching all those years and working with all those students gave me the confidence to switch projects in my work. If I wanted to go back to using my Leica and doing black and white photography, making a project, I just did it. Because the students could do anything they wanted to do. I wasn't making them do gum printing or Van Dyke printing. Uh, they could do whatever they wanted, as I could when I was in school. So I, I was a little, you know, envious of their freedom. So I figured that you know, why shouldn't I do that? The, the last photographs I did, uh, I did in Cuba in December with my iPhone and multiple apps on my iPad. Yes? How do you pr promote your students' creativity? I know, I'm, I'm getting deaf. I, oh. how, how do you promote your students' creativity? Well, I've been retired for 17 years now, so you'll have to ask Brian about that. <laughs> Brian, Brian took my non-silver class, and one of the first years I was teaching at UNM, I taught non-silver. The first project I had them do was working with Codolith film, which I thought was a kind of a beautiful thing all by itself. It was transparent, and so I had them do a transparency project. I kept twisting their little arms into being more creative. I believed that they were really better than they believed, and and I would push them, and I'd go, oh, come on. You, you know, you have no idea what you're capable of. Uh, he came in the class, and his cyanotypes right out of the gate were spectacular just amazing so I never forgot that well, thank you. Uh, I, I had studied with uh, I was very West Coast photography I, I, I loved Oliver Gagliani who was my zone system guru so I went into Betty's class very strict uh, zone system I don't know how I got accepted to UNM but I don't either <laughs> <laughs> Because I thought that's what you were going to do. I know. You, you let me know that you were kind of unimpressed with, with my creativity. You know, and, and, and Betty just wanted more from us. You know, 
and she was there to help us. You were very prolific in your own work, and we did have some pretty epic parties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yes. That's how. <laughs> uh, one, one last question. Because I wanted to ask you, what was it like working with Jerry Uelsman and uh, Robert Fichter and uh, was Jack Wellpot there? That? Yeah, I knew him. And anyone else in that group? Um, you know Gail Smalley? She was a West Coast photographer. She's taught at Fresno State. Uh, David Harrisick, who was a curator at the Smithsonian. Okay, well, when I got there to Indiana, I was 17, and uh, like I said, Henry was my um, undergraduate counselor. Jerry Ulsman was his lab assistant at the time. So that's how I met Jerry. So I was on my way in, and Jerry was kind of on his way out. Uh, but I saw quite a few Jerry Ulsman photographs around. None of Henry Smith's, but lots of Jerry's. Jack Wellpot came one summer just to hang out with Henry Smith, which is how I met uh, Jack. And Robert Victor, I learned an awful lot from. He, he, uh, he was serious, but not serious. And I think his attitude toward photography was uh, really important to me um, because I tend to be kind of frowning and serious. You know, things better work. And and Robert wasn't that way. Um, and one time I told Henry Smith, I said, you know, you were so important to me. Without you, I just wouldn't know anything. You really changed my life. And he said, nah, you got it all from Victor. <laughs> so a little competition there. <laughs>